morning. Good morning. Hello, hello. Donna's not happy with me because when I log into Facebook Live, <laughs> for some reason with an update that just came out, I don't know, in the last few weeks, <laughs> the moment I hit Facebook Live, it's got the video reverse. So she gets to be on camera first. I try to hit that before I go live, but I missed it this morning. So she was going, the camera's wrong. <laughs> Gene won't walk behind me when I've got the camera going because he doesn't want to be on film. Me either. <laughs> yeah, too much stress. <laughs> I love live videos. I really do love live videos. I love it that not any of you guys expect me to be perfect or professional. I mean, I think we're professional, but uh, not a perfect professional. How about that? I want this to be right here in my dining room with people at my table who love God that's reading the Bible every single day. That's what we do. Isn't it, Jan? That's what we do, right, girl? Let's see who all's on. Jan's on with us. There's Tracy. Tracy was the first one that popped up this morning. Good morning. Uh, there's my friend, Debbie Curl. Hi, girl. Jana, oh my goodness, I just love all you guys. Debbie Nolan's with us, and Lynn, Lynn Walters, and uh, I just scrolled by somebody. <laughs> oh, a few of our Donnas are on with us. I love all of our Donnas. Love you guys. <laughs> <clears throat> We're in 1 Kings chapter 18 today, reading about Elijah. I just, I love it. I just, I don't even know how this happened. I don't believe in coincidence. I believe in coincidence, as my friend Donna always says, but I don't believe in coincidences in the kingdom of God, but it just happens to be that the teacher who I listen to every single morning, every morning, and I do mean every morning, don't I, Tom? Every morning <laughs> is teaching on Elijah right now. And here we are, we're reading about Elijah. Boy, just blessing my socks off. <clears throat> you know, that King Ahab was something else, wasn't he? Mm. Good morning this morning. Did I tell who good morning? Good morning this morning. I did say good morning, Lord. Yes. Did you tell Jesus good morning? Good. Good morning, Lord. Got my daddy on the phone with us. <laughs> Hi, Lori. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Jesus. My daddy called me yesterday and said, we need to be looking for Jesus. We need to be telling him good morning. First thing we say when we wake up, that's a good thing. So there's just a few things going on in the Old Testament reading with Elijah. Just a few things. Just a few things going on. I find it quite interesting. You know, King Ahab was the most evil king ever. His wife, Jezebel, was evil. In fact, here we are still in 2022, June 17th, 2022. And there's churches and there's pastors and there's teachers that will teach classes about the demon spirit, the the demon spirit of Jezebel and Ahab and will warn you against that. And I think we give them way too much credit, quite frankly. Um, um, I, and, and all I mean by that is I don't wanna give them any, any, any more power than they think they can have at all. But um, I guess one of the things that I thought about when I read today is about this famine, you know, 1 Kings 18, verse 2 says, so Elijah went to appear before Ahab. Meanwhile, the famine had become very severe in Samaria. Very severe. I, I'm not sure in today's modern world, at least here in America, maybe I should just limit it to the four states I've lived in. I've been in situations where it was extremely dry. I mean, 
I lived in San Angelo, Texas for 18 years, and that's a pretty dry climate compared to, to Kansas or Oklahoma, where I grew up. I mean, they only average around 15 inches of rain a year anyway. And I went through several years of no rain that it was dry as a bone. I mean, every course down there, they don't call them ponds, um, they call them stock tanks, <laughs> but the ponds were all dry. They use a lot of windmills in West Texas um, to pump water from underneath the earth and the windmills were dry. Uh, I, uh, I've seen that, I've seen dust bowls, I've seen the wind blow. In fact, right here in Oklahoma this past week, we had a day the wind blew that Tom and I had drove up on top of a hill and looked out at a location we normally can see the skyline of Tulsa from, and we could not see the skyline of Tulsa because there was so much dust in the air, but nothing like what they experienced here. And I think it's important for us sometimes as we read this, I don't, I don't know, I'm probably the only one, right, that rushing around. In fact, this morning I had, you know, somebody that did some Marco Polos with me talking about some situations going on in a family. I had another phone call that I took that I probably shouldn't have taken during my quiet time in the morning. And next thing you know, I'm reading my scriptures last minute. So I've only read these once today. You guys know I like to read them more than once and um, didn't spend the amount of time. I, I know I'm the only one that ever does this, that last minute I grab my Bible and I'm going to read it. So I have to read real fast. And so I have a tendency to just rush through it and I don't take the time to pause and really let it sink in what I'm reading. This famine was so severe, people were dying. Here in America, at least in the four states I've lived in, I've never been in a famine so severe that even people and animals were dying. I, 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 I can't imagine it. But this is the backdrop of the story today. And so, I also find it interesting, interesting how King Ahab, you know, it was his wife that ordered the, the prophets of God to be killed. And we, 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 we see in here, they talk about Obadiah, who hid a hundred of them and, and brought them food and water to keep them alive, to keep them from being killed, is here. And how they went from killing 450 of them or however many they killed to Obadiah hit a hundred and now here we are Ahab's having conversations not just with Obadiah but then with Elijah and you and you see Obadiah's response to Elijah when he comes across Elijah and Elijah tells him to go tell Ahab to come to him that he wants to talk to him I mean fear a uh, fear, you know, and I, and I set the backdrop for this, for the fear, because it wasn't just the fear of how much Ahab hated Elijah. It, it was, it was fear upon fear upon fear. It was fear multiplied. And yet God had spoken to Elijah. God had given Elijah a word, you know, um, and so Obadiah, Obadiah did what God told him to do. When I read verse six, Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went another way by himself. One of the things I thought of was how evil separated itself from the godly um, in that moment. But that's not really a big point. I could go on and on with that, but I won't. So, um, but down here, uh, verse 11, let's, well, Let's start in verse 10. For I swear by the Lord your God that the king has searched every nation and kingdom on earth from end to end to find you. And each time he was told Elijah isn't here, King Ahab forced the king of that nation to swear to the truth of his claim. And now you say, go and tell your master Elijah is here. But as soon as I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you away to who knows where. I've got that highlighted from many years ago 
This is Obadiah speaking to Elijah. <laughs> and he says, but as soon as I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you away to who knows where. There really, there's not any indication that Obadiah has ever met Elijah before. I didn't do the research, so I don't know if they had ever met before. Um, regardless, they, they didn't live together. They didn't hang out together. And yet Elijah's reputation was such that the spirit of the Lord would just whisk him away <laughs> to who knows where. Uh, my point with that is this is old covenant. This is Old Testament. This is before the regenerating spirit of the Holy Spirit had come to the believers. And yet Elijah's reputation was such that the spirit of the Lord could just, just whisk him away. And of course, in our very, very last paragraph today, I'm going to jump ahead just to make my point. Um, so Debbie, follow along. I'm not going in order. I'm going to jump around just a little bit. So <laughs> at the end of today's Old Testament reading, verse 45, and soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and he ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. So Elijah's reputation is one that the Lord will just whisk him away. I mean, he'll just poof, he's gone. And we read about that. And then today we're reading about how the spirit of the Lord came on Elijah so strongly that he ran ahead of the king's chariot for miles. I mean, oh my goodness. I mean, I sat here in Little Sky Took, Oklahoma. And I get up every morning and I read and oh my goodness, I'm so obedient that I do these Bible studies and oh, you know, we, we do ladies retreats. And my whole point, I'm being a little tongue in cheek here is that I, I'm not sitting back idly and doing nothing. I, I mean, I would actually be so bold as to say that to the best of my ability and the best of my knowledge, I'm serving God every single day. But I guess I just questioned why Elijah and why not me then? I mean, what is the difference in Elijah and me? There's obviously big differences, right? Why, why is it not your reputation that God will just whisk you away? Why are you not tucking your cloak in your belt and running with supernatural strength? I mean, Elijah's not a young man right here. He's been around the block a time or two. And why aren't you cloak, you know, putting your cloak in your belt and running ahead of a chariot? I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? I, when I read things like this, I just know there's more. I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful for where I'm at with the Lord today, right now, today. I mean, I have seen healings. I have laid hands on people. We've seen deliverance. We've seen lives restored. I've seen marriages healed. I've seen uh, cancer gone I, I mean miracles hmm. but I haven't seen that and 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 quite frankly the rest of the story is just pretty amazing the reason I emphasize the famine so strongly is there was no water in the land and yet Elijah tells them to bring out the prophets of Baal to have them prove that their God is God and not his. And I love it how, <laughs> um, first of all, let's, let's go to verse 21. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions if the Lord is God, follow him? My goodness, is there areas in your life, is there areas in my life that I'm hobbling? between two opinions i mean i know what the united states government the laws they've passed that they say is legalized in the united states now versus what the word of god says am i hobbling between two opinions i i 
I understand that there is a movement across the land that would want to force me to believe that a seven-year-old child gets to determine their gender instead of, as my favorite teacher says, checking the plumbing and let God be the deciding factor. Uh, are we hobbling between two opinions? Uh, don't even get me started there. I guess I better move on because that's not my point. Um, but down verse 27, about noontime, Elijah began mocking them. So they he's brought together these 450 prophets of Baal, this idol they've created. And he's told them, so if your God is God, show me, show me the power of your God. And then he starts mocking them. I just think, the boldness, I mean, the boldness of Elijah. We won't even confront somebody in the slightest way today. I mean, the movement across our land right now is, we can't tell somebody it's a sin. In fact, the movement across the land right now is there is no sin. Everything's good. Everything's right. If it feels good, do it. And, and here he is mocking them. <laughs> I just, there's so many lessons from Elijah that we can learn. It's so important for us to just not just read these stories and oh, wow, what a cool story that was. He, he called on God and God burned up that uh, sacred uh, sac um, sacrifice on the altar. Well, no, there was a lot more to it than that. Do you, did you read how many barrels of water he had brought in? Do you know how precious that water was? I mean, Elijah wasn't just going to make a point. He was going to make a point. I mean, he's making it where it was near impossible for this to happen outside of God. Wow. Wow. And, and his faith. And then, and then after the fact, he tells Ahab in verse 41, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. First of all, I wonder, well, if he if he destroyed the Baal prophets, why not destroy the evil king? I, I thought that this morning. Uh, isn't that something? I mean, Ahab was there. He, I, what was Ahab's response to the miracle he just watched? It doesn't really say. I mean, it, it really just says what I just read. <laughs> just like in conversation, Elijah, go get something to eat because it's going to rain. Now, it hadn't rained in years. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And, and Ahab went and did what Elijah told him to do. Do you see the shift in how things were from when we first started reading this story? And then how did Elijah know? How did Elijah know? Really, we could say this all throughout reading about Elijah. How did how did he know? And, and we're back to that hearing God's voice. How, and then how did it come to be that in a severe famine with not a cloud in the sky, Elijah is so bold as to proclaim it's going to rain. And, and you know, um, once again, remembering the day of Pentecost had not come. Jesus had not come. The Messiah had not been born. The comforter had not been sent to replace Jesus's physical presence on the earth. The Holy Spirit had not come to bring the power. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I totally understand the Holy Spirit was with because the Holy Spirit wasn't created just at Jesus's resurrection. Um, it's always been. There's never, ever not been the Trinity the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, but my point is, is the change that we live under with being new covenant believers, the, the post-Jesus Christ folks that we are, Elijah didn't have the benefit of that. How much harder was it for him to hear God's voice speaking to him? And we struggle today. We struggle today thinking God speaks to us. There's, there's more believers today that will tell you they don't know how to hear God's voice than there are ones that'll say that they can hear God's voice. 
And today, for the first time, I had the thought that Elijah heard God speak to him in his heart. I, I've oftentimes talked about how when I hear God's voice, it's like there's my brain. And, you know, when you have thoughts, it's firing these electrical pulses throughout your brain. And for me, I'd always thought about it um, in the way that then God speaks and it's a still small voice that kind of interjects this thought in the middle of all my thoughts. And I have a choice in that point in time, I can determine, is that God's voice or is that me? Am, is that just my imagination? Am I just thinking it? Am, did somebody else say it? How do I know it's God's voice? And, and, and really, I'm not at the root of that process. I'm, by the time it gets to my brain, it's already a done deal. It, that's not where it takes place. It takes place in our heart because the Bible tells us we have the mind of Christ and the mind of Christ resides in the spirit of Christ that lives inside of our heart. So the mind of Christ exists inside of my heart. God speaks to us in our heart. It's a still small voice, but we have to listen, not with physical ears. Elijah wasn't listening with physical ears. Elijah was not seeing rain with physical eyes. But I believe with everything in me, Elijah saw the rain before it ever came in his heart by faith. We live by faith, not by sight. Unfortunately, most Christians live by sight, not by faith. If they can't see it, they don't believe it. Well, what do you mean I'm healed? The doctor still says I have cancer. Well, no, the Bible says that you were healed by the blood of Jesus Christ on that cross, that he took that cancer on him so you don't have to. And we have to come from the place in our heart of healing. If God's spirit lives on the inside of you, me, of you then, then healing lives on the inside of you. God is healing. Hi, Deborah Nelson. I love you. Oh, I miss you so much. What I wouldn't give to sit down and have a good cup of coffee with you. Um, the healing lives on the inside of us. And so healing has to come from the inside out. Most of us, regardless of what our prayers are, I mean, what, are, what is it that we want? What is it that we're seeking? What is it we want God to do for us? We look out here for answers. Well, I want my healing to take place. So I'm going to look to a doctor. Or I'm going to go on Google and I'm going to I'm going to search the internet and, and then by golly, I want to see it on my physical body instead of being Christ centered and, and using our God given God created imagination to believe the things we can't see. We don't, we don't take those scriptures to the depth that we need to take it. And therefore we stay shallow when we remain shadow shallow and we don't get the depth of what God has done for us. I mean, Elijah is such a picture of that. I mean, are y'all grasping the level and the magnitude of what we're reading here? Ahab, the most evil king that ever was, and Elijah, one of the most famous prophets that has ever walked the face of the earth, operated in the power of God in miraculous ways that's never been duplicated. Wow, we are reading an, an, an amazing historic text here today, but spiritually there is so much power in these words that I long to understand it. I want God to take me into that deep place that I can then start seeing what he's telling me inside of my heart first. What is it that God's told you to do? What is it that, that he has said for you to do? Is it raise your babies? Then start seeing your babies raised as godly men and women. You see them before they're ever there. You see that, that, that spiritual spouse, the, the one that God has already picked out for your babies. 20 years down the road that they're going to marry, you start seeing that person ahead of time. You start seeing the healing before healing ever starts. You start seeing yourself walking in forgiveness of that person that's hurt you so bad before it ever takes place. That's what faith is. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. Elijah walked in a level of faith, faith that I long for.
oh my goodness for me to believe the way Elijah believed. And yet God in his infinite wisdom shows us the humanity of Elijah and, and the areas in which he failed because I fail, lest I should think, oh, well, it's just because of my failures. It's just because I, I don't have enough faith. Seeing that right there is a, a false statement because the Bible tells us that God pre-measured the level of faith he gave to all of us. We have the exact amount of faith. It's just that we let it stagnate. We, we don't exercise it. We, we don't believe. See, it doesn't matter. I can, I can wrap up this nice, neat little box right here and I can put a million dollars cash in it. Boy, it's stacked and compressed and right here. And I got this great big purple bow. Are you using your imagination to see it? Here's the box. Here's the big purple bow on it. And I just handed it to Tanya. And I said, Tanya, I've just given you a gift. And she picks it up and she bounces it and she moves it and she rattles it and she sets it down. And then I tell Tom, I just gave Tanya a million dollars. And, and Tanya looks over at Tom and says, no, she didn't. Well, yeah, I just gave Tanya a million dollars. No, she didn't. I don't have a million dollars. Well, that's what we do with the level of faith that God's given us. He's given us, he pre-measured. God doesn't make mistakes. He pre-measured how much faith Jean needs, how much faith Jada needs, and Tanya, and Donna, and Tom, and me, and you. But but we'll sit around and say, well, I guess, I'm, I guess my faith just isn't strong enough. I just, I don't have enough faith for that. Well, I, 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 I'm just so worried that my kids are going to struggle. I'm so worried that I won't be able to do, you know, God told me he wanted me to build a business and it's hard. And, and I, I you know, I didn't know it was going to be this hard if God told me to do this. And, and then we start cowering, we start backing up. I didn't, I didn't see Elijah cower anywhere in here, did you? I mean, he didn't cower when he come before. In fact, he called out the most evil man that walked the face of the earth in this time, Ahab. He didn't cower. Why do we cower? Oh, I could keep going. Can you feel the intensity? Do you think maybe this story spoke to me this morning? Things in my life that I know that I know that I know that I know God has called me to do this. And yet I've had this sense of with it's a recoil. That's what it is. It's a recoil. It's like, boom, I'll go forth because God said, go, Elizabeth, boy, I'm going. And then it gets hard. And it's like, ooh, I want to recoil. Ooh. Well, maybe my faith isn't strong enough. Well, maybe did I hear God right? Well, did I? No, no, that's not what I ought to be doing. That's not what we should be doing. I mean, by golly, we ought to cry center. And right in here, I ought to be able to draw the picture of the end result of what God called me to do. Mm. That's the sanctified imagination. It's where faith is birthed. It's where faith grows. It's like the gymnasium that, that injects steroids into our faith. It cause our faith to be stronger and stronger to where doubt can't even, I mean, doubt can't even touch us. Doubt shouldn't be able to come within a thousand miles of me. Ah, mm, I got to move on. Acts chapter 11. <laughs> I'm going to start right in verse one. Acts chapter 11, verse one. Soon the, soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea that the Gentiles had received the word of God. We just read about Cornelius, the first Gentile to be saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles and you even ate with them. Huh. They criticized him just like they criticized Jesus. Ooh, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors? Oh, yeah, y'all can, can just, you know, roll your eyes all you want to. We're all guilty of this. At some point in time, we all look down our nose at somebody. 
oh Lord, help us. <laughs> and Peter told them exactly what had happened. I was in the town of Joppa, he said, and while I was praying, I went into a trance and saw a vision. Are you seeing visions from God? Are you praying enough that God will speak to you in visions? I, I will tell you I'm not very often. Has it happened? Yes. Has it happened probably to the level it should with me? I'm telling you not. I'm too busy working. I'm too busy getting up and being busy, quite frankly. I'm too busy sitting on my phone, all the television's playing, instead of spending the time in the word with the Lord. Hmm. <laughs> um, verse 11, just... Just then, three men who had been sent from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were staying. The Holy Spirit told me to go with them and not to worry that they were Gentiles. The Holy Spirit told me. What is God speaking to you? Right now, today, June the 17th of 2022, what's God speaking to you? If you can't answer that, then I'm just going to suggest that you spend more time reading, spend more time praying, spend more time with the Lord. I'm speaking to myself. I'm speaking to myself. I can tell you some things that God's telling me right now, but I can tell you that I'm not spending enough time in the Lord, in the word, and I'm not spending enough time meditating on his word and listening for his voice. Verse 15, as I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them. You know, I read these words. I was raised to believe a certain way. But there came a point in time after I started reading this book for myself that it was no longer about the way I was raised. And it's about what I know for myself. I mean, I've had a lot of thoughts about other religions, other religions that don't believe in the one true God and how those babies being raised. So they're born into that household and it's all they hear. It's all they know. How do they ever, ever get to the place of knowing who God is? But, but I turned that around also in that the way I was raised as a small child where my brain's not fully formed, I can't even think properly on my own. And I'm being told and I'm being exposed to uh, the certain church I went to, the certain ways of that church, the beliefs of that church become cemented into where I didn't realize that maybe they weren't my beliefs. It's simply the way I was raised until... I get out into the world and then I got people say, oh, no, I don't believe that way. Well, that's of the devil. Oh, you do that. Oh, well, you believe this. And, and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We got a whole denomination here that believes that. We got another denomination that believes that. We have another denomination. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. What, what is the truth? There's only one truth. One truth. There is one truth. It is written. You either believe this book or you don't. And right here it says in verse 15, as I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he fell on us at the beginning. Then I thought at the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, it's not a judgment for me, those who don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, those that don't believe in the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of, see, God knew we'd doubt. He knew we'd tell one another lies. He knew one person would say, oh, that's real. Somebody else would say, no, it's not. The evidence of, once you speak with a language that you don't understand, and, and it doesn't leave you. I mean, I wandered in the desert for over 15 years, living a life that you'd have never believed I was saved. Um, and the moment I stepped back into church, my prayer language flowed again. I never lost my prayer language. And once you experience that, you know, 
<laughs> there is no doubt I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. He knew we would doubt without it. it there's no other purpose for the evidence of the evidence of, I mean, he knew that we would be divided about the power of the Holy Spirit, even though it's written. I read these words and I think, how in the world do we have denominations set up that doesn't believe this? How does that happen? <laughs> then I thought of the Lord's words, verse 16, when he said, John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? Who am I to stand in God's way? Lord, where am I standing in your way? Am I standing in your way with a person in my life? Am I standing in your way, Lord, in my own life, in what you want me to do? Help me, Lord, to get out of the way. Don't let my limitations be somebody else's limitations, Lord. When the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. See, I just believe that by the sound of my voice, reading these words over the airwaves, through cyberspace, whatever it's called, that the objections will die down and people will believe. Mm -hmm. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. Hallelujah. The verse 21, the power of the Lord was with them. And the large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Verse 23, when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Psalms 135 is excellent, and I'll end on the Proverbs. The Proverbs these last few days has just been, they're all so good, though. They're all good. Proverbs 17, 12, and 13. It is safer to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than to confront a fool caught in foolishness. <laughs> if you repay good with evil, evil will never leave your house. Wow, what a warning for us. Mm -hmm. We've all had a temptation that somebody we didn't like did something good to us. And we didn't want to repay it with good. All of us. There's not one of us exempt from that. But man, that puts it into perspective. If you repay good with evil, if somebody's trying to be good to you, why would you want to hurt them? Why would you want to dig them? Why would you want to make a point? Why would you want to just, I got to be right? Why would you be stubborn? If you repay good with evil, evil will never leave your house. Thank you, Lord, for your wisdom being written down on black and white paper that we can read the words and know your heart. You guys have a fabulous Friday.